Hi there, and welcome to Central Texas Gardener. I'm Tom Spencer. The drought's taken its toll, but it's time to renew. One of our top questions is how to screen a view even in limited space. So today, Christine and Bill Reed from Reed's Nursery have brought drought-tough ideas and tips for planting this fall. On tour, let's head to a San Antonio courtyard garden. When Claire Golden bought a 1920s Mediterranean bungalow in San Antonio's Alamo Heights, she restored both the interior and exterior. In 2008, the San Antonio Conservation Society presented her their Historic Preservation Award. It all started a few years ago when she was driving by and saw that it was for sale. And you can't help but look at this house from the street if you're really looking at prop, I mean, gardens and land and homes. The light falling on its original terraces convinced her that it was time to leave the long-term home and garden she'd made with husband Jay Y for Joseph Yale, who passed away in 2000. In the garden's renovation, her first call was to Carlos Cortez, a Faubois concrete artisan for a bridge he had designed. The water that once flooded the yard from the street was redirected into a stream. The dry bed was there. The form was there. And I thought, hmm, what a waste. Claire turned the problem into an inviting outdoor foyer. Even in summer, it's a refreshing place to entertain. Cortez designed faux bois furniture to match the setting. In back, architect Don B. McDonald included the garden in his house renovations. Although the house was designed around a courtyard, it was just grass until Claire realized its potential. When you travel to Mexico, you go to Italy, you go and you see things and you see how people live in courtyards. If you're interested and you look, you bring something back from each trip. And certainly Mexico was a strong link and their gardens. From the flat courtyard, McDonald terraced the narrow hillside into a series of rooms, connected by a miniature aqueduct, a series of ponds and rills. He accented with close-up mountains. With structure in place, it was Claire's turn to consider plants. It was very stark and very hot without the plants, and it was scary. And I looked with trepidation at this bright white rock and brick. As Claire found plants and hauled them in, she worked with McDonald as well as designer Charles Bartlett. Four palms augment the aqueduct's vertical definition. They accented with textures that soften and cool the stonework. I did it just by love, not by uh, training. Not by training, but my mother loved to garden. And as you see, there are not many flowers here. I'm more of a bush lady. Um, I kill flowers. <laughs> 
So you see a few flowers and a lot of greens. And I, I feel more comfortable with it. Still, she tucks in flowers everywhere, many of them sentimental favorites. But the anchors are large leafy specimens chosen for texture. Their flowers and fruit are a bonus. The courtyard and the way it is, it lends itself to growing plants that <clears throat> retain their plant life even through a freeze. For the central access view of the courtyard from indoors, architect McDonald designed a loggia. Claire and Bartlett extended the garden to the guest house, renovated by McDonald from its former life as a garage and quarters. Throughout, Claire's mischievous personality, designing hand and vision, turned ideas into destinations. It's hard for me to look at it now objectively. <clears throat> it's like your family. And so when you, when you grow with something, which I feel I have, is growing with this house and growing with the plants. When you do that, it, it becomes family. Thanks so much for sharing your garden with us. And now we're gonna turn our attention to planting. Yes, I said planting. Those of us in Central Texas still believe in planting and fall's a great time to be replacing things that we've lost in the drought and looking for tougher plants that we know will survive. Joining us to help with this discussion are uh, Bill and Christine Reed from uh, Reed's Nursery, and it's a pleasure to have you back on the program. Thank Thanks you. for being here. Let's start off, Bill, by talking about the nursery itself. Uh, where are you located and how can folks find you? We're in the, what we consider to be the Kyle Uland area, mm -hmm. out in the country, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, if you went down 35 from Austin and went east on 150, you would go a little bit north on 21, and then there's a big, beautiful meat market out there, and you take a right-hand turn on 2720, and we're a mile down the road. Okay, so in a quickly growing part of Central Texas, yes. lots of folks who are uh, building new homes and... Uh, probably replacing a few shrubs yeah. right now, I would think. Yes, sir. <laughs> They're thinking about it. <laughs> well, we're all thinking about it. Yeah. And fall is, uh, if, if you're going to replant, this is the time of year to do Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Uh, you know, for a lot of reasons, right? Absolutely. You get that root system developed before the summer heat comes in. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, anytime the temperature's above 45 degrees or so, there's still root growth going on. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's a lot of time between now and summer to get that that's yeah. going so and we all know right. how important it is to get the plants established exactly. you know if, if this drought's going to continue this is be critical and I know lots of folks are thinking about replacing things so let's dive in and start talking about some of your choices for things that you think really are merit stepping in and filling in some of those dead gaps in the landscape the first plant that we're going to talk about uh, is this beautiful tight green evergreen in front of us here, and this is the wax myrtle, southern wax myrtle. Uh, tell us about your experiences with this plant. Well, it's a pretty hardy plant. Uh, it does need to get water to get established. Mm -hmm. Well, any uh, plant does. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and after that, you know, mm -hmm. it, it should be fine, uh, except in extreme droughts. But mm -hmm. it's very uh, hardy. It's uh, Beautiful evergreen, it uh, gets those berries, has those fragrant uh, mm -hmm. leaves. Good wildlife plant. Ex absolutely, and it's uh, it's what we consider when a lot of people come in and they want privacy hedges, some kind of screening, that's mm -hmm. a good one to put in. Mm -hmm. um, it can take sun or some shade, Right. and it gets to be, well, more than 12 feet. Right, so, I've seen them as tall as 20, I think. Exactly, yeah. so it's a great, great uh, evergreen. Well, and you know, one thing I really like about the wax myrtle compared to a lot of other evergreens is it's not stiff. It moves in the breeze, right. it's got a nice loose form. Very graceful, yeah. It's it a is nice a graceful form. plant. So that's a, that's a great one for folks to consider. 
I also think it works pretty well as an understory plant. So right. a little bit of shade is okay. Right, it can take some shade. Right. So it's it's t you know it's flexible. You yeah. can use it in different situations. Yeah. So, so we really like them. Wax myrtle, and people should remember that one. Well, the next one, you know, this summer it's hard to avoid recommending leucophyllum or cenizo, <laughs> our little Texas sage plants. Uh, and this is a particularly beautiful specimen. Well, that's a great plant because, as you know, it, it, it is drought tolerant. Uh, mm -hmm. It's going to maintain those beautiful leaves mm -hmm. uh, that get to be about eight feet. Can take the blazing hot sun. Absolutely, yeah. They don't mind at all. And it's it's been nice this summer. You do see those things, and that's been one that's yeah. always looking good. Let me tell you, and just even just the hint of rain, right. <laughs> and you get this beautiful get display. Get those flowers. And it's this great. one, I have to say, is particularly beautiful color. I've never seen one with that yeah, much red in the purple. Yeah, shade, yeah. 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 I really love the Sneezos. They come in all different uh, 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 leaf patterns. Some mm -hmm. are real tight silver leaves, some are uh, green leaves, uh, usually more of a uh, kind of blue-purple. Right, yeah, and some have the small leaves, and then, mm -hmm. of course, there's compact forms that don't get too tall. Right. Because a lot of people might want them, like, underneath mm -hmm. their windows, you right. know, right. so they don't have a... Don't have a pruning job right. in the future. They kind of like low maintenance. But blazing hot sun, not picky t about the soils. Yeah, it's very but, tolerant. But yeah. like the wax myrtle, you got to water it that first year. Yeah, exactly. Get it started. But yeah. after that, it's it's pretty good. The next plant on our list is bottle brush, and this is a plant that um, has spectacular blooms on it. Real interesting uh, bloom form as well, mm -hmm. and this particular specimen's also got a really graceful form. That's something exactly. that they can have. Same thing, you know, beautiful shape, and uh, mm -hmm. the one you don't see that often, but it's it's a tough plant. Mm -hmm. It's low water, uh, obviously it doesn't lose its leaves, so it's nice mm -hmm. to have because, again, we have people come in and want that some kind of a, a screen, right. and this is a good one to put in. Let's talk about cold hardiness on, on this particular one. This is one that in the past I kind of hedged on recommending because I'm afraid of that winter where they might get burnt to the ground. What's your experience? Um, I think I think more ordinarily they're fine. There might be an extreme situation mm -hmm. which everything might suffer, but yeah. I think they're pretty tough. Mm -hmm. And um, it's the trick with all of them, of course, is get them watered and mulched get them through the cold, right. that makes a big difference. You right. Know? Well, I, I think the plants are beautiful. And this is one that, again, sun is, uh, yeah. you're going to get the best bloom out of Full it. Full sun, sure. absolutely. I think yeah. that's happiest then. Yeah. So, uh, and a nice accent plant uh, oh, or yeah. screen. And different. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's fun different. to have different things. Yeah, I like the narrow leaf on it too. Yeah. Well, it's hard to beat this plant for <laughs> toughness. In fact, this, this can kind of take over areas. It, if it, it, it could. It's th This is the better behaved right, form of the as, plant, but uh, not as, uh, aggressive as the parent plant. Right. The native cross vine, vine is uh, the monster I'm referring to and dealing with my own garden <laughs> right now. But this is a tangerine beauty, which is an improved variety of the native cross vine. Very nice one. And all-star plant for Texas. Exactly. Tough. Uh, of course, the hummingbirds love those flowers. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, once you get it established, you're probably going to be in good shape. We've had weed eating situations where it gets weed eated to the ground and it still comes up. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's nice. At least you don't have to worry about it uh, needing uh, right. any pampering. And I have had this in, in situations where it's been in the back corner of a garden in an area where I rarely water. And it would go through the summer and I yeah. might water it once. They're really good about that. You know. They, they, and again, it's, it's mostly evergreen. Mm -hmm. So... It's pretty to have. It's a right. nice uh, switch from maybe yeah. some Gr annuals. And it grows nicely in a fence. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah a lot of different, can be used in a lot of different ways. I love the cross vine. Yeah, that's a terrific plant. So, you know, and one of the plants that you brought, and I love the fact that we're going to be talking about this, we don't talk about that often, is the fig ivy. This is ficus repens. It's the creeping ivy that grows up the sides right, of brick buildings. That you see on an old shed or something, right. and it's completely covered with right. old <laughs> Well, it can, it can you, yeah. it takes a little trimming. But yeah. in, in times when it's so blazing hot, this can really uh, shelter our home and protect yeah, it from exactly, the sun. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a great, great vine for that. And again, tough. And um, it, it's probably you don't you want to pick carefully where you put it because it is going to cling to it. Mm -hmm. But as long as you pick wisely, I mean, it's a great vine, and yeah. I love it. I love that it's evergreen. Oh, well, and the, and and again, we we're trying to think of all different ways to save energy and to cool our homes, and that's just a, a great one right. to do. And uh, again, a sun or shade on that plant. Right, right, which is nice. You have yeah. some flexibility there. 
Now next to it is a plant I know nothing about, which is butterfly vine. I uh, love the look of it. It looks like a senna to me, but everything with that kind of flower looks like a senna to me. <laughs> <laughs> Those colors, yeah. yeah. That's an interesting vine. It's also a tough one, uh, mostly evergreen, low water, uh, very flexible in that it'll take some sun, full sun, or it'll take shade. We have one in the greenhouse that's we have one planted in the back greenhouse. Taking it's over the corner. Huge, gorgeous. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it, we hardly ever water it. Right. We, we, we just walk past it every day and it's just doing fabulous. It's uh, got a light fragrance, mm -hmm. really nice flowers. And um, the reason it has, it has several names like a lot of plants, but this one, uh, the flower heads look like butterflies. I see. And a lot of times the, the, the dry, when it gets dry and brown, People use them in flower arrangements. Mm -hmm. It's really pretty. Yeah. So it's a nice vine. I well, love it. It also gets the real interesting seed pods on it, yeah. right. which are unique. I love it. Well, so that's butterfly vine, and mm -hmm. right next to it is a plant that I think is underused, and I know you're a big fan of. This is the sweet viburnum. Uh, it's sold under a variety of different names in the nursery trade, but. Uh, uh, this is a, a great evergreen plant that you really like to recommend for screening. Yeah, exactly, because uh, it can get up to 20 feet tall. Mm -hmm. But even if it doesn't get that tall, it's still definitely going to be a great one to screen an area mm -hmm. if you want privacy or right. cover up something. But it's a nice one, and it gets the fragrant flowers. Right. And, and it's not too sprawling of a plant. It's an, it, yeah. You can see it's got this vigorous, upright growth exactly, habit. Exactly, yeah. So it's, t it's usually pretty tight. Yeah, you don't have to pruning. prune it that way. It'll just look very, like you yeah. say, kind of formal. But, mm -hmm. but it's very nice. It's, uh, it's got that nice shape, and I love those dark green leaves. Yeah. They're so pretty. It's my favorite of the non-native viburnums, and I, I'm with you. I think it's underused, and it's sweet viburnum, mm -hmm. and uh, one that people should be on the lookout for. Now, real briefly again, I just want to let folks know Reed's Nursery down in the Kyle area, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, can folks find you online as well? Mm -hmm. we, we, we ha we're online. Uh, we have a website. Uh, we also have a lot of information on it regarding planting trees and, and taking care of plants in drought. Okay. It's, well, it's in our events section. Okay. Well, people should be aware of that. Thank you both for coming back to the program. And it's time now for Daphne. Hello and welcome to Down to Earth. I'm Daphne Richards. This week's question is, what is the difference between a cultivar and a variety? Well, I often hear these terms used interchangeably and there really isn't that much difference as far as the average gardener is concerned. But to plant breeders, horticulturists, and botanists, there is a very clear distinction. Varieties are plants with slightly different and usually desirable characteristics from other plants in its same species. Varieties may have more attractive flowers, a dwarfed stature, a trailing instead of upright growth habit, tastier fruit, etc. Varieties of the same plant are naturally occurring and are usually found in geographically distinct regions from each other, but they hybridize easily if brought into contact. If you see the shortened VAR, then a third name on a plant tag after the species name, that indicates that the plant is a variety. But these days, you're more likely to see plant tags with the initial CV or a third name in single quotes after the species name than you are to see VAR. CV indicates that the plant is a cultivar, which means that humans were involved in its creation. In the early history of man's relationship with plants, many cultivars arose from the simple act of human cultivation. But these days, the creation of cultivars is big business with the race to crossbreed species and varieties to come up with the latest and greatest new thing, a thriving industry. Large companies release new cultivars marketed specifically to those gardeners with a discerning eye and a bent towards the progressive. But cultivars are also meant to catch the eye of the more casual gardener, who sees the plant's fabulous, or at the very least fabulously marketed, attributes. And just like other man-made items, companies want to protect their investment, so cultivars are patented, meaning that no other company can reproduce or sell that plant until the patent has expired. The knockout rose, seen by some as the easiest, most carefree rose on the market, is an example of a cultivar, or actually a series of cultivars, since now there are knockout roses with many different flower colors than the original bright cherry red. Our plant this week is also a cultivar, Euphorbia diamond frost. This delicate looking little plant is actually quite tough and has withstood the test of time in many Central Texas gardens. Although it is only listed as hardy to zone 10 and we're zone 8, my friend Pam tucked it in amongst some other plants to insulate it from the cold. 
and a few of her diamond frosts came back after our incredibly cold temperatures in the winter of this year. It has also withstood our hottest summer on record. The key to getting this annual to be a perennial is to disregard the label which says to plant it in sun to part sun. In hotter, brighter climates such as ours, diamond frost should be planted in an area with bright, filtered light or light shade. Receiving morning sun should also be okay. It gets only 12 to 18 inches tall and wide and is covered with delicate white blooms for most of its growing season. If planted in shade, diamond frost requires little supplemental irrigation, but do be careful not to let it dry out. But if you do lose it to heat or cold, simply treat it as an annual and replant it in the spring. It's truly a plant that will be unique in your garden, but it's also not a plant that you may be able to find at this time of year and not really appropriate to plant in the fall since it is cold sensitive. This is a great one to look for next spring in your garden. Augie's pet of the week is Pierre, a mini, pincher, chihuahua, and dachshund mix. As a puppy, he keeps his dad, Michael, busy, but there's nothing he likes better than to go out and smell the flowers and chase some squirrels in the morning. He also has great play dates with his friend, Augie. Thanks, Michael and Pierre, for sending in this great picture. To do in your garden this week, if you haven't divided your spring and summer flowering perennials, go ahead and finish that up now. We'd love to hear from you. Please visit klru.org ctg to send us your questions, plants, and pets of the week. Thanks, Daphne. Now let's check in with Trisha Shirey for Backyard Basics. Beautiful daffodils and tulips and hyacinths are some of my favorite signs of spring. And if you enjoy them, it's time to start thinking about getting those in your garden for next spring's bloom season. You'll want to purchase the bulbs soon because the nurseries sell out of the best quality bulbs fairly quickly, but you'll want to wait a little bit to plant them. I usually plant when the nights are under 50 degrees for several weeks, but get your bulbs in by the end of December because they need several weeks of cold to produce blooms. If you're purchasing tulips and hyacinths, they need to be stored in the refrigerator for six to eight weeks, so it's time to get those purchased in, in the refrigerator now. Even Narcissus that I'm using for four Forcing indoors, I keep in the refrigerator for about three weeks before planting them up in pots. Now, better quality bulbs are going to give you a lot more blooms. Larger bulbs produce more blooms. Look for bulbs that don't have soft spots, that aren't dry. They should be very firm to the touch with no mildew or mold. And uh, plant them in full sun or early spring shade. Uh, and always plant pointed side up. Now, things like pecan trees will leaf out late, so that allows you to plant the bulbs under those trees before they uh, leaf out and uh, provide too much shade. You can use a dibber or a bulb planter. These are traditional bulb planting tools, but in our Texas soils, I find that a trowel just really works best unless you've got really nice chocolate loam that uh, these tools will work well in. I do like to plant in clumps. Uh, groups of five or more are going to give you best displays rather than having one bulb here and there throughout the garden. Amend your soil with compost and add some fertilizer for bulbs or just a blooming plant fertilizer. Now in Texas, we'll plant the, the bulbs twice the depth, not three times the depth that's usually recommended. Bulbs will tend to rot if they're planted too deeply. And mark the location where you plant them so you don't forget and put something else on top of them. It is important to allow the foliage of the bulbs to yellow and die naturally after the blooms finish. So you can interplant them with perennials like daylilies or penstemons or betony to hide the unsightly foliage until it's time to trim it back because that foliage is, is feeding the bulb for next year's blooms. Tulips are only gonna bloom once unless you get some of the clusiana or other type bulbs that do repeat here. After several years, you'll wanna divide the bulbs for best bloom after the foliage fades. These are some bulbs that I dug up last year after the spring. I didn't have time to replant them, so I just stored them in a cool, dry place. And I could actually divide these bulbs, but with this Narcissus bulb, I'm gonna get a bloom spike, probably two bloom spikes out of this, and then each of these will provide a bloom spike. These less expensive bulbs, I'll probably only get one small bloom out of them. So uh, it does pay to get quality. I'd rather buy 10 really good quality bulbs than buy a bag of 50 of something that's uh, not gonna give me a great looking bloom uh, season. 
So there are lots of bulbs that do well here and many that will perennialize. Some of them will give you one time bloom and then they don't come back. So over the years I've compiled a list of bulbs that I do like and, and that grow and, and provide me bulbs to share with my friends. So you can check our Central Texas Gardener website for a list of my favorite bulbs for the Central Texas area. For Backyard Basics, I'm Tricia Shari. Thanks for joining us. Visit klru.org slash ctg to watch online, get more tips, and to read our blog. Next week, Meredith O'Reilly identifies our butterfly caterpillars. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online, and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org slash ctg.